tell those who are joining us online and through our uh, awesome uh, um, website. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this morning is a very exciting time. We are going to have uh, Chinway Black be sharing her life with us for communion. Um, most of our college students are at a beach fest this morning with the Los Angeles campus down in Redondo Beach. So they're out there having a good time and celebrating. And so we may have a smaller, smaller group here, but it just goes to show you how they take up half the church seating when they're here, which is fantastic. It's amazing to watch them grow, grow spiritually and grow in numbers. So without further ado, I'm going to say a prayer and then Lewis is going to lead us in prayer. I mean, lead us in worship. God, we just want to take a breath and just relax our minds, relax our spirit. We want to be in a place where, God, we can hear you through music. We can hear you through a song. We can hear you through someone's testimony. We can hear you by a story in the scriptures that would move our hearts closer to you. God, we want you to know that we are open for your presence. We welcome your presence among us. Please walk among us. Please be with us, lift us up, encourage us, guide us, correct us, teach us in the ways that we should go, God. Holy Spirit, show us what you're doing. Uh, show us and lead us through not just our feelings, but the scriptures as well that can reconfirm what you're doing in our lives. And it helps us, Father. So thank you so much for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do the slides too, but I'm not good at multitasking. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. If I could just have you stand up with me this morning as we prepare to sing to God. <clears throat> now, uh, I know uh, we're missing a, a few of our members today, some of the young ones, you know, with all that energy, but you know what? That don't mean nothing because together we are strong, you know, and, uh, and just God loves to hear joyful noise. Amen. So I want to hear some joyful noise from you guys today. Um, you know, the nice thing about, you know, having you guys here today is I know I would say at least 90% of you know the songs I'm going to sing today. So I don't have to teach them to any of them young campus kids, you know what I mean? Uh, so uh, we'll see. Uh, we're going to sing Praises Heard Around the World, all right? And if, uh, if you don't know, uh, it's pretty easy. It's a little call and response, and uh, it'll be, you'll pick it up pretty quick, I think. All right. Lord, your love has saved us. Lord, your love has saved. Your precious blood has bathed us. Precious blood has bathed. Now your message takes us. Now your message takes us all around the world. All around the world. Can't you hear them? Hear them. Hear them singing. Hear them singing to the Lord. They're rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting, singing, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Praise is heard around the world. All of your creation, all of your creation, each and every nation. All right. Sending your salvation, sending your salvation all around the world, all around the world. Sing, can't you hear them? Hear them, hear them singing, hear them singing to the Lord. People there rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting, singing, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praises her around the world. Against the demons fighting, against the demons fighting. Holy Spirit guiding, Holy Spirit guiding. Family, we're uniting. All around the world, all around the world. Said, can't you hear them? Hear them singing. The people there rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting, singing, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Praises heard around the world. Praises heard around the world. One more time, sing aloud. Praises heard around the world. Amen. All right, next one is Lead Me to the Rock. 
Lead me to the rock that is higher than die, higher than die, higher than die. Lead me to the rock that is higher than die. You're my tower against the foe. Hear my cry, oh God, won't you answer my prayers? Answer my prayers, answer my prayers. Hear my cry, oh God, won't you answer my prayers? You're my tower against the foe. Lead me to the rock, lead me to the rock that is higher than die, higher than die, higher than die. Lead me to the rock that is higher than die. You're my tower against the foe. I'll take refuge in the shelter of your wings, shelter of your wings, shelter of your wings. I'll take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You're my tower against the foe. So lead me to the rock, lead me to the rock that is higher than die, higher than die, higher than die. Lead me to the rock that is higher than die. You're my tower against the foes. I'll fulfill my vows day after day, day after day, day after day. You sound great. I'll fulfill my vows day after day. You're my tower against the foes. So sing me to the rock, lead me to the rock that is higher than die, higher than die, higher than die. Lead me to the rock that is higher than die. You're my tower against the foe. You're my tower against the foe. Amen. Give me a sec here. <laughs> oh. Give us a moment. Thank you. Rockstar, thank you so much. Okay. Let me do this. Okay, awesome. It's gonna take a minute. Sorry guys, one sec. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I'm Chin Wei. Good morning. Um, <laughs> nice to meet and see you guys. I am about 48 years old, and I've been a part of this body of churches for about 27 years. So um, I want to share a bit about my life and my relationship with Jesus and how it is everything uh, that I have that is, is worth anything. So um, I'm going to start with a quote by an author named John Eldridge from a book called Waking the Dead. And it's this, the story of your life is the story of the long and brutal assault on your heart by the one who knows what you could be and fears it. He says, we are in an epic battle. Things are not what they seem. We are at war and that war is against your heart, which is your glory. Isaiah 61 one says, and it's, this is something that Jesus read when he was speaking in the synagogue. He says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And I love the juxtaposition of what John Eldred said and what Jesus said, because if we don't know that we're in a war, we don't know we're in danger. We have no idea we need to be rescued. And I feel like that is exactly who I was and who I have been and sometimes who I am today. Um, for me, the long and brutal assaults on my heart have pretty much always been aimed at my belonging and my worth and, and love. It's always tied to love. Um, so I grew up the youngest of uh, three kids um, in an amazing family, totally awesome. My amazing sister, best friend in the entire world is here today from Maui, so it's so encouraging. Um, and she is, is, we are each other Samwise Gamgeean. <laughs> right up back. And so, anyways, um, but for me, um, we grew up, uh, we started at 
uh, started school at an African cultural school. So imagine these three little black kids at a school called Omawale Ujama moving to an almost all white private school. <laughs> Very confusing. So I was in first grade when I started at that school. Um, there was lots of racism, lots of prejudice, um, and a lot of confusion about where I belonged. So I spent my Monday through Friday in that school, you know, learning and just confused because people didn't really look like me. I didn't feel like I belonged. And then on Sunday at the black church with the hallelujahs and like, it was very confusing. My whole life, I'm like, I don't know where my place is. So I began to put things on. I began to put on certain characters. I, I didn't look like everybody, but if I could straighten my hair, then my hair looked like theirs and all these things just internalizing. Okay, maybe I'll belong if I this, maybe I'll belong if I that. So that was my life growing up um, through college, just really my whole life. Um, by the time I was 21, which is when I was invited to church, um, and I grew up in a, in a God-loving family, like generationally God-loving family, but we didn't really know how to live the life, you know, the, the daily, daily life. Um, by the time I was 21, I was trying to fill like the gaping holes that had been created by trying to belong somewhere. So it was drugs, it was alcohol, it was men, it was just changing, pretending and kind of getting further and further away from who I really was and having no idea who I really was. So I was empty, I was lonely, I was confused and no matter what I did, it just created bigger holes. And that is when Jesus cut in. And he was like, there's a scripture that is in the Psalms and he says, you tell the waters this far and no further. And I feel like that's what he spoke over my life. Like, okay, I'm stepping in now. Even though he was there the whole time. But um, there's a scripture in Isaiah and it says this, it's talking about Jesus. It says, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. And for the first time, all those feelings that I was running from, I was like, not only am I not alone, but he felt that and he took that, not just for me, but because of me. And that was the beginning of a belonging like I had never known. And so I got baptized. That was my redemption, salvation, amazing moment. And I think I lived for a while thinking, okay, this is it. Now I have arrived. And I think it's, I think it's huge, <laughs> but it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning of the next chapter. Because what I brought into my life of following Jesus, was like, okay, now I'm going to do good and be good in all these great roles. Like, I've been given so much. What can I do to give back? Like, how can I meet with people, pray with people, fast, study? What do I need to do? Lead, give it to me. I'm in. But then it became more things I was putting on, more character traits. Like, let me be inspired. Let me be faithful. But in the times where I didn't feel that, I was like, but I have to because it's for God. And then, there's another scripture, and it's in 1 Corinthians, it says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standard. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And I think even when I received salvation, was baptized and all that stuff, like I still didn't get it all the way and I may not get it until I'm looking God in the face and that's okay. But to be foolish and lowly and weak, the things that I always run from, God's like, I see you there. And that's the one I chose. And that is like something I cannot process. 
but it's the thing that just washes everything away, like my strife that comes back every day, like, what do I need to do? How do I, am I doing it well? Am I, do I belong, God? Do I belong to my husband, my kids? He's like, at your worst, with nothing put on, no makeup, no, I don't wear makeup anyway, sorry, but, you know, none of the things you put on to be accepted, like, that's where I chose you. That's who I love. And not only that, but that's who Jesus became in order for you to have what you have with me. I was watching this movie called Wonder. I'd like to say I was reading the book, but I haven't read the book. I was watching the movie. Um, but this kid, is he's very deformed. And he hides. He spent a lot of time hiding his face um, with this helmet. <laughs> and his dad took the helmet. And he found out in the end, he's like, why would you take that? And his dad says, I miss your face. I know you don't like it all the time, but I do. I love it. It's my son's face. And I just feel like that's God's message for all of us. Like, I love it. You don't need to hide it. All of it. I love it. You are my son. You are my daughter. And, like, I am so grateful to God. Like, everything I have, every shred of anything good is his goodness on me. And I feel like even though I still strive so often, his message is always that reminder, like, I know you don't like you all the time, but I love you. You are my daughter. So um, I just, I guess that's just where God has me right now. What I wanted to share with you guys this morning, I just want to leave you with one scripture. It's Philippians 3. And it's Paul in one of those moments, you know, where you just get it. This is where he's coming from. He says, but whatever I used to count as my greatest accomplishments, I've written them off as a loss because of the anointed one. And more so, I now realize that all I gained and thought was important was nothing but yesterday's garbage compared to knowing the anointed Jesus, my Lord. For him, I have thrown everything aside so that I may gain him. When it counts, I want to be found belonging to him not clinging to my own righteousness based on law, but actively relying on the faithfulness of the anointed one. This is true righteousness, supplied by God and acquired through faith. So I just want to take a quick moment to pray, and then we're going to listen to a song for communion. Um, the song is a little bit not like your normal communion song. It's really written as a lullaby. And I think we can all relate to trying to be so much in this world that we're faced with every day and trying to be strong. But this is like God's lullaby to us saying, like, just come and rest. Like, no one loves you better than me. No one's been a better friend. So I'm going to pray and then we can start the song. Dearest God, there's no, no one who loves us better than you. God, in this place, this place of worship, this place, God, where your holiness and your righteousness and your kindness and your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness reigns, where your body can come together and your spirit is full and present. In this place, God, help us to lay it all down. Jesus told us to take communion and to remember him. God, we don't just have to remember the things of old in the Bible we can remember this morning. We can remember the dark nights. We can remember the victories. We can remember his presence. We can remember your eyes on us, eyes of love and not judgment, eyes of grace and not anger, your gentle, gentle fatherly touch. God, thank you for this time to worship you you are deserving. Please help us to settle our hearts and remember you. In the name of Jesus. my arms. 
arms just breathe and you'll be safe and sound with me Chinway, thank you so much for taking us to God and sharing your life. And it's awesome. Um, good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody. Uh, if you're wondering where our young people are at, they're at, a, they're at the beach right now. They're enjoying a beach fest for the, all the campus students in the LA campus ministries. They're all down there having a good time, having playing volleyball. Uh, I'm going to close out our series of entitled Mirage. You know, we've been reflecting on this profound metaphor of what a mirage is and it's how it relates to us in our spiritual journey. A mirage is an illusion, uh, a trick of the eye that leads a thirsty traveler believing that there's water where none exists. It's a, it's a really powerful symbol of the distortion of reality in our spiritual lives that can creep up on us. It can represent the danger of seeing God through the lens of our own desires and expectations. And we looked at this picture as a mirage. We, we, can, we can find ourselves crafting and falling into a trap where we want, we want God to mirror our ambitions and our preferences and affirming all of our choices. And, you know, I talked about, I want God to love me by affirming all my decisions. And we talked about Cain and his choices. And then we moved on to, I want God to fix everything in this world, with, but don't touch anything. 
Remember that? This morning I want to talk about, I want to find peace through trusting what I can't trust. What is the thing we want? We want, we want something, and sometimes this happens to us, we want something that doesn't exist. And it's a mirage. Life can be a mirage. We can accumulate stuff, but stuff gets old and rots. We think you have the coolest iPhone now in five years. It's like, well, you have that phone, right? You can pursue pleasure, and happiness will elude you. You can seek health and beauty, but you will still end up in the ground. You can trust leaders, and leaders will disappoint you. You can love people, and people die. Can we construct one of the greatest civilizations? They all crumble. Can you construct one of the greatest philosophical systems? They all get put in history books anyway. Everything comes to an end. And we want something we can trust. We want something that we can really hold on to. But that's only half the story. Take all the, the human things that we obsess over. You, new cars, political victories, celebrity status, forbidden pleasures, boundless intellect, flawless beauty, fortified finances, indestructible relationships. Humans can obsess over images rather than over the real things. Only in the imagination do, we, do these obsessions ever live up to our expectations and hopes. And our minds tend to sober up. When we actually get a little bit of a dose of reality, we start to sober up and realize, man, what am I chasing? You know, in truth, most people try to put their self, in, uh, their self into a religious system. You know, I, think about it. If, if I master the eightfold path and achieve nirvana? What if I submit to Allah and achieve paradise? What if I ferment revolution and achieve a classless society? What if I develop humanity and achieve humanism, heaven on earth? What if I assert my truth and achieve authenticity? I may be claiming that I'm putting my faith in this or that object or whatever, but I'm really, at the end of the day, I'm putting really faith in me, in myself. So I want to share a story with you about a king of the Bible who trusted something he knew he couldn't trust. He put his trust in something that he knew was not trustworthy, but he does it anyway. He follows the mirage. We're going to meet a king, and I'm going to give you a backstory. Uh, Saul became the first king of Israel. Then David took over, and then David's son Solomon took over. God chose the family, it was the Jewish family that God decided to have himself come down into form of a man that we know as Jesus. But before that, God rescues them from Egypt. He led them to the promised land. God, they wanted a king. God gave them Saul. Saul didn't do too well. Then God rose up David. Then David had a son named Solomon. And they ruled over these 12 tribes called Israel. Uh, Solomon's son showed himself to be a hard and rigid guy, ruler. And they end up splitting the, 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 the whole nation of Israel into two different sections. Because he would not look for the win-win. He said, it's, 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 it's going to be this way. And so he divided, if you look here, this area, it became the northern son of, of Solomon, the, the, the called Israel, and this became Judah. And this was all the Jewish people here, the, the, the Israelites, but it got broken into two. And in this northern kingdom, there was a lot of influences from Phoenicia. That's where Jezebel came from. Remember her? And then there's this, uh, this nation called Aram. If you, if you remember your story in your Bible, Ammon and Moab came from the sons of Lot and their, his daughters, unfortunately. And Edom was the brother of Jacob named Esau, and that was all Red Hills, and so he took that one uh, and called him Esau. Philistia was where Goliath ends up camping out and fighting David over here, and they came from the sea and the ocean. They were pretty tough to, to remove. So there's this northern king, and his name is Ahab, and they worship this spiritual being called Baal. You might read that in your Bible. And Ahab was so enamored by Baal because his wife that he decided to marry was not an Israelite, but he married a Phoenician. And so she introduced the, the God of Baal to him, and he fully embraced it. And he built altars and temples, and he constructed poles for Baal and his wife, his consort named Asherah. And he commissioned hundreds of prophets of Baal for his palace, and he decided to hunt down all of God's prophets that remained, but from time to time, God would send a prophet to Ahab 
to warn him of what he was doing was catastrophic and will lead him astray. And he did not listen. So what happens in the story is this guy, Baal, dominates the Israelites. They worship this guy. He's an interesting guy. His name is Baal. He's called the storm god because he provides water for your, for your vegetables and your gardens and all your animals. And he wears the, this horns of a helmet because they call him he's the rider of the cloud because and the, the story goes that he conquered this other god named Yam, he's the god of the sea, only to be slain by Moth, the god of the underworld. And on his way to the underworld, Baal has, Baal has one last hurrah, and he, and he mates with a, with a heifer, with a bull, that, that explains the horns. And he was not able to, the, to end the Baal cycle there, and, and then a knot comes. And it's this really riveting, complicated story of how he comes to be, explaining fertility and death. And this god dominated the area of Israel. And for some reason, King Ahab said, that's my guy. And so God would send prophets going, that is a inferior being that God created. Get away from that guy. He will lead you astray. So God is trying to warn the Israelites. So here's the story. And uh, we're going to take a look at Ahab is blinded by the mirage. And so I'm going to uh, make this little For three years, there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, that's the southern part, remember that? The southern part, king of Judah. He uh, went down to see the king of Israel. And the king of Israel had said to his officials, don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram. So he asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead. So they want he wants this little territory right here. He's like, that used to belong to us, but you know, the Arams own it, and it was part of the 12 tribes originally. Let's go and take it. Now, just north of this is an interesting area here. This is where Mount Hermon was, Bashan, where Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church. Because that's where the sons of God came down in Genesis 6 and hatched their plan to uh, marry the 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 the, the the females on earth and create giants. So this area is very sinister. So he wants to reclaim this area here. He needs Jehoshaphat's army. He needs his uh, uh, you know, military prowess to accomplish that. So Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first, let's maybe seek the counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets about 400 men, and he asked them, shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into the, hand, in the king's hands. Now, these were the 400 prophets who worshiped Baal. He brought them in. He brought, hey, guys, he made a show of it. Should I go attack Ramoth Gilead, or should I refrain? They were like, go for it. And they were encouraging him to take on the, the battle. For this particular battle, the, the king of the north, Ahab, he wanted to form an alliance with Jehoshaphat to get him on his side. But Jehoshaphat became a little suspicious. He's like, hey, shouldn't we inquire? Um, is there a prophet of God around here? And so let's see the story. So Jehoshaphat asked, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here who we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered, Joseph, there is uh, one prophet through whom we can inquire, Lord, but uh, I hate him. I hate his guts. He never says or prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. His name is Micaiah, son of Imlah. You know, King Ahab did not want to hear from Yahweh's prophets. Earlier, two chapters earlier, God sent Elijah to King Ahab, and there was this big contest, and there was a two altars that were supposed to, the God who really exists or the God who is really superior would answer by fire. And so Baal and the 400 prophets danced all day and cut themselves, and there, nothing happened to their altar. And Elijah's altar, he says, put some water on that wood, pour some more water, dig a trench around it and dump some more water on it. And then he prayed, and God answered with fire and consumed not just the wood, but the stones. And everyone goes, God, Yahweh is a true God. And Elijah says, 
kill all the prophets of Baal. And so just a few years ago, Elijah came and killed the 450 prophets of Baal. A few years later, here we are again. He got 400 more prophets from Baal and says, should I go attack Roth Gilead? Yes, you should. The mirage was so thick. He wanted to believe what he wanted to believe. So we're going to get a good look of what a prophet is like. A, a prophet, according to the, what the Hebrew Bible explains, is this. A prophet had to have sat in, in a vision in God's counsel to hear what God is actually saying. And then there were guys who didn't, who didn't get that vision or didn't get that presence, and they would say, claim that God's saying this, but it wasn't true because it never was in the presence of God. So any prophet who was real, their predictions had to come true. And if they didn't come true, you knew they were the false prophets. So God would always send these prophets in, but it always be bad news, and the kings hated bad news. They wanted good news. Go attack Ramoth Gilead. Sometimes we just want to hear good news. Sometimes we just want a friend that's going to tell us what we want to hear, and then we push away the people that God is sending going, that's probably not a good idea. And like, no, you never say anything good about me. And we can end up just like Ahab in a mirage if we don't surround ourselves with people that are willing to tell us from Scripture the truth at times. You have to have grace, but you also have to have truth. And it's a nice balance that God gives us. So let's continue the story. So they dressed in royal robes. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor of the entrance of the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before him. Now Zedekiah, the son of Canaan, had made iron horns, and he declared, this is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. Way to go, buddy. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hands. Now, you know, these prophets were just telling King Ahab what he wanted to hear. These prophets did not sit in God's counsel room. They were not given the vision to tell Ahab the truth because they didn't worship God. They worshiped another spiritual being named Baal. They weren't worshiping God, but they were trying to convince Ahab that they're all the same. This is okay. Yahweh says, Yahweh says, but they weren't worshiping Yahweh. So as I told you a few, a few years ago, they had a battle between Elijah and Baal. And Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal. So when he arrived, the king asked Micaiah, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? And he replies, Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give him into your hands. And Ahab's like, What? I can't believe my ears. This cannot be the word of the Lord. So Ahab thunders back, How many times must I swear, make you swear to me? to tell me nothing but the truth. You see, Ahab knew. He had his doubts. How much, I make you swear to me, tell me what God says. And so he goes like this, okay, fine. Then Micah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. Obviously, Micah was mocking the other prophets by agreeing. Yes, go, please. Then he goes, no, tell me the truth. Okay, if you go there, you're dead. If you go there, Israel will have no king. And the Lord said, these people will have no master. Let each of them go home in peace. That was what Micaiah told King Ahab. Remember, this is the second go-around with God's, prophet, God's prophets. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he never prophesied anything good about me? But only about, see, I told you. I told you. All the optimism are wrong. I mean, I mean, it's good sometimes to have a guy who's a little Debbie Downer, who's that one cloud in the blue sky in your life. It's okay to have that guy in your life or that girl in your life. It's okay to have someone that's going to say, that's probably not a good idea. Don't do that. But what happens here is Micaiah is going to pull back the curtain. And it should tell you and I something about how God operates in the cosmos, how he operates in the heavens, and how he operates in the earth. And this is how we know God is in control. So it's a little pulling back of the curtain. And we're going to see a little bit of what Micaiah says. He says, look, therefore, 
hear the word of the Lord. He goes, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with the multitudes of heaven. The Hebrew word is the armies of spiritual beings. And he's surrounded here in the bottom right. The Lord is in his council room. The Lord is sitting with all his spiritual beings, standing around him on his right and on his left. And Yahweh, the Lord, says, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? God has made a decision in the spiritual realm that Ahab has to go. He is so bad that he has to go. So he asks his counsel, who will go and entice him to go attack Ramoth Gilead? And one suggested this, and the other that. You know, they, they had some plans. Hey, let's try this God. Let's try that God. You know, it's kind of like a leader's meeting. Hey, gee, let's try this. Let's try that. Right, let's go. All right. And then God goes, finally a spirit came forward and goes, I will entice him. By what means? The Lord asked. I'm going to go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all the prophets of Baal, all their prophets. I'm going to go through Baal and say, yeah, go. You'll succeed in enticing him. So he's explaining to King Ahab, that's why your gods are saying, oh, go, 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 because God has enticed them because God has called your ticket. He's pulled, he's punched your ticket. It's time. You'll succeed in enticing him to the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all of your prophets. The Lord, our God, has decreed disaster for you, King Ahab. Wow. The curtain is pulled back on how God operates in the heavenly realms and into the earthly realms. He has his leadership team right there. The divine council, scholars call this. He operates with, God can do it himself, but God likes to work with people. He likes to partner with us, right? He likes to partner with you and me and do great things. He's always doing that. Holy Spirit's working. We're, we're activated. We're doing things. He's blessing it. But God goes, it's time for Ahab to die. How are we going to do this, boys? He goes, I'll do it. I'll deceive his prophets of Baal to go attack Ramoth Gilead. God goes, good idea. Then Zedekiah, the son of Kaniah, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the Spirit of the Lord come from when he went to speak to you? Because he's mocking him because he said he sat in the council and he saw God in the temple and in the council. So Micaiah replied, you're going to find out on the day you go hide in the inner room. I wouldn't want to be that guy. The king of Israel then ordered, take Micaiah and send him back to Mom, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the, king of, and the king's son, and say, this is what the king says, put this guy in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. And Micaiah goes, if you ever come back safe, the Lord has not spoken through me. Mark my words, all of you people. Wow, what a, what a dramatic scene. What a moment. And you're thinking, what is Ahab must, what is, he, what is he possibly thinking? He's going, you know, we know he had doubts because he goes, is there a prophet of Israel? Yeah, he gives me bad news. And then when Micaiah comes in, he goes, go attack. Tell me the truth. He really wanted the truth, but he didn't want to accept the truth. He didn't want to live out the truth. And so, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat went out to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter the battle in disguise. So he kind of believed the warning, like, you're going to die up there, don't go. So he's like, oh, all right, I'm going to go, up there, but I'm going to wear a disguise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear, wear the disguise of a foot soldier. And Jehoshaphat, you're going to wear the royal king stuff. So no one's going to know who I am. He's, he's trying to get around what God says. You know what? That thing about me, if I wore the king's outfit, they're going to kill me. But if I wear the soldier's outfit, you know, I'm going to survive this battle and I'm going to take Ramoth Gilead. Sometimes we can try to outmaneuver God. We can make attempts. And he's making a bold attempt to outmaneuver God in this prophecy. So, true to his character, he rebels against Micah's prophecy. But someone during the battle, Jehoshaphat went up there, they chased Jehoshaphat, and they say, oh, he's not, he's not the king. And they, back, they backed out. They're during the fight. It says, someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the sections of his armor. Randomly. Mysteriously. How could that possibly happen? 
And the blood from his wound ran onto the floor of his chariot, and that evening he died. As the sun was setting, a cry spread through the army, every man to his own town, every man to his land. Exactly the words of what God said would happen. A sheep without a shepherd, everyone will turn to their people. They will be scattered. He went into battle and died. Disguised himself. Try to do a little clever move there. And then Micaiah answered this scripture. What, this is exactly what he said would happen. These people will have no master. Let each go home in peace. And that's exactly what happened. And as long as Ahab worshipped something he couldn't fully trust, he would never find peace. What a restless soul he was. Putting his trust in something he knew he couldn't trust. He didn't really trust the prophets of Baal fully. But he wanted the land so bad. He lived in a world that didn't exist. Ahab's heart could never find rest as long as he half served what he half trusted. And such contractual arrangements with God or anything is like a relationship. Lovers tend to use each other. They go back and forth between thrill and resentment, but they never find lasting contentment. In the same way, Ahab used Baal's services, but he would never find himself resting contentment. He struggled, never found it. Jeremiah, one of the later prophets of Judah down south, said this, my people have committed two sins. This is of God. They've forsaken me and the springs of living water, and they dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. A mirage. I want to find peace through trusting what I can't trust. We sometimes we want something in life that just doesn't exist. And God is trying to remove the mirage. He's trying to help us. And the more you spend time in your Bible, the more you take a dedicated life of just spending some time, little by little, over time, you will find God, and you will find God's will. You'll find his story matching with your story. And they align together. And the Holy Spirit will use you in a great way. Because when you want to find peace through something you cannot trust, you'll never find peace. Ahab never found it, and it cost him his life. Isaiah said this uh, in, uh, in 725 B.C., Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of chariots, and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. You know, sometimes we, we think there's, there's, oh, God's got to be there, and it's just a mirage because it doesn't exist. He cannot fix everything without touching anything. He's going to touch things. He's going to touch you, right? There's a whole list of mirages that we've gone through the, the last several weeks. And I want to encourage you. We find God in repentance. We find God in rest in your salvation, in the quietness, and the trust is your strength. But you would not have none of it. That was the relationship that Israel had with God. And we can learn from that. And we can learn from them. It's, it's, it's in our repentance that we find God. It's in our it's the desire to change. In the quietness, we find God. In our trust is our strength. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let's move our hearts from things we cannot trust to the one we can't trust. Let's pray together. God, uh, we are so thankful for the story of the Israelite king Ahab and the many prophets you sent his way and the many people that you tried to help him turn his heart to trusting you. And we know sometimes that's real for us, God. It can, it can be a real dilemma for us to fully trust you and trust a process that you're you're working even in the uh, the valleys of darkness you're working through the toughest of times you're working through the most difficult situations your light is still there be a lamp for our feet in the darkness help your word show us the way help our repentance and our quietness god and in our trust we find true strength we love you and thank you it's in jesus name we pray amen
Here's our special missions update. July 28th is our final day for special missions. Uh, our Baltic Nordic Mission Alliance, we're at 6982. Let's go. That's awesome. Keep it going. This is what we're trying to accomplish, a goal of 25,000, 40% being a May, 30% shoreline. We're still a little under budget. We got a financial meeting tonight with the boys, and we're going to discuss that, shoreline's future there. And uh, we have a specific South with church planting and strengthening, which is awesome. Santa Barbara needs some help, so I think we might help them. And we're also helping out the Ventura County Rescue Mission, the Battered Women's Shelter, and the Homeless Shelter they have in our county, because we want to take, take care of people that we live among as well. Uh, there's our special missions. Uh, we also have a new church app. Please uh, go to the App Store, download it today. It's the Shoreline Church Camarillo app. You'll love it. You'll find messages on there. You'll find groups to join, great community, and great time to build some camaraderie there and, and uh, figure out also what's going on in Shoreline. All the events are there. Everything you need to know would be on the app. Um, here's some ways you can give. You can give through our, our website, and you can also give actually through the app as well. And last week was Father's Day. I'm wanna, I wanted to show you a, uh, a little video from the Baltic Nordics. This is from Lithuania. And she has a little one-minute message for you guys to encourage you guys. She's, uh, she's pretty awesome. She's one of the churches that gets support from the BNMA. And I'm going to... Hey there. Uh, here are some news from church in Lithuania. My name is Annette and I will quickly tell you what has happened here in Vilnius during the last year. Uh, currently, our church consists of uh, 24 members and last year we had two baptisms. The first one was a baptism of a girl who came from Ukraine and she had a charismatic background, but then when she moved, she decided to get baptized and join our church. And a few months later, uh, she baptized her friend uh, a girl also from Ukraine uh, who was not a believer before and she decided to follow Jesus last year. Uh, so now we have six people in our youth group and we are really grateful for that. Um, what's more, right now we are as a church working on our uh, social platforms and uh, website to be closer to people and to evangelize and we believe it works. Uh, also, one more thing is uh, we have an open call for leaders and pastors for our church because currently we don't have uh, them and uh, we're searching for a pastor for the church and also uh, for a leader for our youth group. So if you're the one who is dreaming to serve to God, this is your chance. Woo, all right. There's a job offer, guys, on the table right there. There's a job offer on the table, Lithuania. So that's part of the churches that we support. They, they got a lot of influx from Ukraine because of the war. A lot, a lot of people came over and, and linked up with the church that were just non-disciples. They were just taking everyone and anyone who came. They took them in and they helped them become disciples. So it was pretty awesome. Uh, if you are married, you always want to work on your marriage. Okay? Don't, be, don't think that your marriage is going to be stronger just because you're amazing. Okay? <laughs> you're only amazing as the people around you and the, and the scriptures that teach you. Right, because a lot of people they drift off and they think oh, I got it on straight, and you know you talk to them and there's some stuff going on in there. So this stuff draws it out. It gives you a time away to relax, but it also gives you good, good fundamental marriage principles. Like I've been going to these for 20 some years now. I always pick up something new, something I need to put into practice. It just reminds you, and I want to encourage you, all the marrieds, to invest in your marriage. It's not a bad investment. Take a weekend. We're going to have a uh, subject matter, matter expert on intimacy. She's going to be speaking on a Saturday. It's going to be phenomenal. She's going to give us a lot of insight into marriage and how we can grow. So please uh, invest in your marriage. It's, it's well worth it. Um, I think that's all the announcements. Karen, everything Are good? That concludes our service. Thank you so much. Enjoy the fellowship. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being online with us. Hope you enjoyed the Mirage series. It was a, it's a series about uh, looking for things that don't exist. And uh, I hope that you uh, found something in the story of Ahab uh, that really uh, hits you well because there are sometimes there are people that are, are wanting to put their trust in something they know they can't trust. So I just hope that uh, you're encouraged by that. I hope that you're 
um, feeling that the scriptures would guide you and help you look through the mirage and see through the mirage and see what's really there and what's really trying to, to, to captivate you that, that doesn't really exist. So we went over three of them. This is the third installment. Uh, you can always find these on our YouTube channel, 805 Shoreline. And you can find them also on our app, our church app. If you go to the app store and download it, you have all the access to the, to the groups, to the activity groups, and to all the lessons. So thanks again for coming out online. We really appreciate you guys. Take care.